Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago, Proverbs chapter 31. It's a magnificent passage describing not merely a godly woman, but as you can see from the end of that passage where it says her children rise up, it's the godly mother. And I think so it's quite appropriate for us to be looking at this particular passage on this Mother's Day. I want to start off, first of all, by talking a little bit about Mother's Day and war. Today I want to give you some thoughts from Scripture on mothers and the spiritual battle that we are facing today. In fact, the battlefield is intensifying and biblical motherhood is under attack like it's never been under attack before. For the most part, unfortunately, the church has utterly and totally forgotten what God commands about motherhood. And as a result, Christian women have failed to play the, the imperative restraining role needed for both the church and the culture to survive. Satan knows and understands the vital role of motherhood. A role given by God for tempering the wild, aggressive, and excessive lusts and the violent, aggressive, carnal behavior of degenerate, morally filthy, and unregenerate men, even in secular society. Even unsaved mothers have a God-given innate ability to produce a stabilizing effect on society as they seek to protect their children. But when the divine standards of motherhood are undermined and destroyed by the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demonic forces, then Satan is able to destroy all the rest of God's divinely ordered institutions and structures. First, let me give you a little history of Mother's Day, which, in the sovereignty of God, was actually inaugurated in the context of war. I think that's quite fitting for our study today concerning what the Bible says about mothers and the spiritual war in which godly mothers are engaged. Today is Mother's Day. It's not an ancient holiday. In fact, it's not a worldwide holiday. In fact, it's not even celebrated in the rest of the English-speaking world, although some Americans have carried it abroad as expatriates. The idea actually originated with a woman named Anna Reeves Jarvis, a single homemaker, teacher, and activist who organized Mother's Work Days to promote health through better sanitation during the Civil War. Anna's mother died on May 14, 1905, which was the second Sunday of that year. And so Anna started a letter-writing campaign to honor her mother by honoring all mothers on the second day, Sunday in May. She wrote hundreds of letters to pastors and to politicians, trying to make this into a national holiday. It's perhaps surprising that Anna had such a focus on mothers, since she herself never married or had any children. But it just goes to show you that one person can make a difference when they put their heart into it. You sometimes feel discouraged? to sometimes feel like everything is against you, especially those of you who are moms or grandmoms, does it sometimes seem like there's no way? Don't give up. The Germans sank the Lusitania on May 7th, 1915. That was almost exactly 100 years ago plus three years today. The idea of Mother Day did catch on. It was sporadically instituted in the United States in 1907 but was not recognized by Congress until 1914, a significant year leading up to the First World War. It's celebrated on the second Sunday in May, this year on the 10th, of course. But in 1914, when it was officially named a holiday by Congress, it fell just one month before the spark that ignited World War I. I think there's pregnant significance in that because we're just one month out from the ignition of a spark by the United States Supreme Court. By June 30th of this year, that sodomite case, which was heard just a few days ago, will have a decision rendered and become the law of this land. We're on the brink of a major war. When the Lusitani was sunk, President Woodrow Wilson refused to enter the war. I hope we don't refuse. By February 1st, 1917, when Germany declared an unlimited submarine campaign with the right to sink American ships and deliberate, deliberate sinking of U.S. merchant vessels, 
plus Germany's attempt to bring Mexico into the war against the United States, President Wilson could hesitate no longer. On April 6, 1917, again one month before Mother's Day, the United States entered the war against Germany. As you know from our message in 2013, on November 14th of 1914, the Eastern forces under General Allenby took the city of Jaffa in Israel and turned inland to march to Jerusalem, which was held by the Muslim Turks. On December 9th, 1917, Allenby got off his horse, walked through the gates of Jerusalem, declaring that the only conqueror that could enter that city on a horse was the Lord Jesus Christ. For the first time in 400 years, from 1517, the year that Martin Luther nailed his theses to the door at Wittenberg, the Turks had held the city of Jerusalem till 1917, 400 years. For the first time in 400 years, the city was no longer in Muslim hands. So World War I was thus a major marker for Jerusalem, the mother of us all, from Galatians, as I preached in 2013. But for mothers, it was a horrible war. American mothers had lost sons in other wars, but not on the scale of loss experienced in World War I. It was in that war that American mothers first began to experience the truly massive loss of sons, husbands, fathers, grandsons. It was mothers' losses in the trenches of Europe that came to the sad attention of the American people right at this time and solidified this holiday in American love and thought. How did that all happen? Well, I think most of you know about June 28, 1914, when Archduke Francis Ferdinand in Austria was assassinated at Sarajevo. I hope you remember, by the way, that not long ago I put a bulletin insert, a full color bulletin insert from Frontline Missions recounting those events and the impact that that had on the church and on missions. Exactly one month later, Austria-Hungary declared war against Serbia. Serbia appealed to its ally Russia the same day, July 29th, an imperial council at Potsdam decided on war against Russia and as a corollary against France. July 31st, Russia ordered a general mobilization. And Germany, taking equivalent steps, sent a 12-hour ultimatum. By noon, August 1st, a state of war existed between Russia and Germany, and the next day, German troops entered French territory. At 7 p.m. that same day, Germany sent an ultimatum to Belgium demanding unopposed passage. On August 3rd, Germany's formal declaration of war on France followed, and on August 4th, German troops crossed the Belgian frontier, for the sanctity of which England stood as the guarantor. So at midnight, in reply, England also entered the war. Truly, Mother's Day was born on the eve before what was called the war to end all wars. And so it is today. There's a massive, deadly, and vicious culture war going on in the United States against motherhood. It is literally a war against biblical motherhood. The four key daggers that Satan has used to stab and slash and mutilate motherhood in the lifetimes of those of us who are present here today are, number one, the legal popularization, even among Christians, of birth control. Number two, the free love hippie movement of the 1960s, which has spawned the illegitimate, immoral barnyard mentality of our current culture. Number three, the legalized abortion movement killing babies in the wombs of their mothers to prevent motherhood. And among some groups in the U.S., killing more babies than are born to that particular group. And number four, and here is certainly an attack against motherhood, the sodomite movement, which is totally sterile of motherhood, except like abortion on demand, by sperm donor banks and gay adoptions. A sodomite movement which is screaming, shredding, and ripping our culture to become a legally recognized, quote, right, as our current Supreme Court ponders the weighty matter of how to set any standards under secular law without God. Folks, as with all four of these perversions, birth control, free love, abortion, sodomite unions, just being legal doesn't make it right or morally approved. And of course, many of the birth control measures used by Christian women who claim that they would never condone abortion are actually abortifacient in nature. All IUDs are abortifacient. 
All birth control pills and birth prevention drugs administered intravenously that cause the expelling of a fertilized ovum are abortifacient. The devil has deceived even a majority of Christian women into thinking that they are okay with God when they use such murderous devices and chemicals to prevent motherhood. So why does the devil hate mothers so much? Well, remember, he managed to deceive the very first mother. He used the very first mother to drag the human race into sin. He used the beauty, innocence, and lure of the very first mother to tempt the very first father to disobey God. He thought that he had beaten the human race through mothers. But God gave him a gut-wrenching, bone-jerking, hair-electrifying, diaper-wetting shock. God made a promise in grace to that very first mother as he cursed Satan. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Verse 15 is called the Proto-Evangelium, the first statement of the gospel in Scripture. The good news of a coming Savior, it would be the seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent. It would be through motherhood that the Savior would enter the world. The first time he wouldn't come as a conqueror, but he would come as a baby, born to a very young Jewish mother. It would be a mother that would bear a son to crush the nasty head of the dirt-biting, dust-eating, death-loving devil. Jesus would be born to a virgin mother, untainted by a sin nature. God in the flesh, so that the seed of the woman would be both truly human and truly God, one person with two natures. That would be the one who would grind the devil's head to mush. And so Satan has always hated mothers and has done everything that he can to destroy them, deceive them, delude them, delay them from becoming mothers, defame them, denigrate them, discourage them, debilitate them, disenfranchise them, dirty them, delete them, defile them, deaden them, demonize them, decimate them, and today through ISIS, decapitate them. But the word of God honors mothers. Remember the passage that we read just a few moments ago from Proverbs 31? The things that God honors are the things that the devil hates. A godly mother is the exact antithesis of Satan's plan to control the human race. Godly mothers stop the insane plunge of men into the abyss of degenerate hedonism. Godly mothers protect, shield, and train the next generation of God's warriors. And look at all the areas outlined in Proverbs 31 that a godly woman, a godly mother, can influence within the sphere of the home. The home is the central command post in this key spiritual war. Look at all the areas of work and activity that a mother can do from the home. We know from verse 28 that the godly woman of Proverbs 31 is a mother. She's not a single woman or a married woman practicing birth control and certainly not a woman with an outside job working for other men who are her boss. She's only working for her husband. She deals with those others as independent businesswoman would do, but she's not under their authority. She's only under the authority of her husband. Look at the multitude of assorted hat-changing areas in which we find a mother involved in Proverbs 31. Agriculture, wise real estate investment, manufacturing, banking, business, artistry, interior design, conservation management and oversight, science, education, international venture, culinary arts, investments, social work, interpersonal relationships, Bible knowledge and theology, and public recognition. In other proverb passages that I was hoping to touch on today, but I don't think it's possible, usually I have about 10 pages of notes. Today I have 17. So I think we'll have to save probably about half of this for some other Mother's Day. But at least I hope we get through Proverbs 31. But there are many other passages in Proverbs, if we had time to look at them, that also touch on additional things where she's seen as a lawgiver, a standard setter, an emotional burdens bearer, a gracious peacemaker, and many, many other things. But first, we look at Proverbs 31. Look at the words that are used to describe the personal character of a mother that God praises. Number one, top and 
front on the list? Virtue. Who can find a virtuous woman? Virtue is excellence in moral righteousness. That means courageous, uncompromising excellence in moral righteousness, true, unashamed holiness and moral purity, a godly, unwavering focus on things of eternal value. That's virtue. That's the very first quality for which she is commended. If you want to be a godly mother, that should also be your first point of focus. Virtue. Courageous, uncompromising excellence in righteousness. Number two, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. She's more valuable than rubies. Did you know that perfect rubies are rarer and harder to find than perfect diamonds? In fact, rubies are far less available than diamonds are. Rubies are blood red. Rubies speak of the heart and of sacrifice. Rubies speak of energy and fire and vitality. And she is far above rubies. The third thing we discover is that she's trustworthy. It says the heart of her husband does safely trust in her. Interesting how the husband appears at different places through this text as we read through it. Because this woman is surrounding her husband with the things that make him great. A lot of men think they did it on their own. <laughs> no. Behind most successful men, there's a woman who has made him great. Remember that, folks. All of us men who think we're so cool. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her. She's faithful. She's dependable. She's reliable. She can always be counted on. She doesn't make petty excuses or try to get out of her responsibilities by pretending to be sick or pretending to be busy or pretending some other foolish thing that she's unable to do it. In other words, she's not an irresponsible flake. You can count on this woman. You can trust her to follow through. You can know for sure that she will do what she says she will do. She doesn't back out of things at the last minute. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. She's trustworthy. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She's good. If we're in the New Testament, I could talk about how there are two different Greek words for good, one that's good intrinsically and one which is beneficial. But both of those are contained here. She will do him good and not evil. It's not just she's good in her character. Good shows up in her actions. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Most worldly women don't know the difference between good and evil. But this woman does her husband good and not evil. She's not petty and childish. She's not spiteful. Many women are to their husbands. She doesn't drag her feet or try to manipulate him. She doesn't stubbornly resist his leadership. She's not recalcitrant or disobedient. She's not sneaky behind his back to try to get her own way. She doesn't undercut him when talking to her friends. Oh, I know of a young woman who is, when she's talking to her friends, if her husband walks up at that moment, I've seen this thing happen. Husband walks up, she ignores her husband because she's busy with her friends. Until finally one of her friends says to her, uh, by the way, your husband is here. Oh, so good to see you. This fake nonsense. She doesn't undercut him when she's talking to her friends. She's not selfish, promoting her own pleasure, the accumulation of her own stuff and goals to his detriment. She sacrifices, and this is important, folks, she sacrifices her personal will. She does him good and not evil. She dies to self to fulfill his goals. She does him good and not evil. We don't like to hear that in our modern culture with our modern women. But that's what the godly woman, the godly mother of Proverbs 31 is like. And you know, it's not just periodically. The very next phrase tells us that. It's a lifetime of consistency on a daily basis. It says she does in good and not evil all the days of her life. Folks, that's consistency. That's day after day, week after week, month after month 
year after year, decade after decade, as they grow old together, she does him good and not evil all the days of her life. It's not just when she feels like it. It's habitual, the day-by-day grinding it out. But you know, for this kind of a woman, it's not a grind. It's a joy because she does it out of her love for her husband. A woman who loves her husband doesn't mind serving and helping him reach the goals that God has put into his heart. And so she has a lifetime of daily consistency. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She's still doing him good right up to the day of her death when she steps into the courts of glory. Folks, like rubies, that's a hard woman to find. But I found one when I found Judy. She did me good and not evil all the days of her life, right up to the moment that she stepped into glory one year ago. When I read this passage, that's the woman who comes to my mind. Note also here, she's proactive in seeking that which is valuable and diversified based on careful pre-planning. Let me explain. She doesn't seek trivia or inferior things. She seeketh wool and flax. Wool is what is used to make winter clothing. Flax is used to make linen for summer clothing. She's not stuck in a rut. She's wisely planning ahead. She's not putting things off until the last moment. Notice also she's a willing worker. She worketh willingly. In other words, she doesn't resent having to work hard. Even at manual labor, it says she worketh willingly with her hands. She's not lazy. She's not slothful. She's not careless and sloppy. She doesn't have the attitude, ah, it's good enough for government work. Like her consistent doing good to her husband, this also willing work is part of her consistent service to her husband by giving her very best at the work God has given to her as a godly woman. Notice also something else. She practices what today is called long distance resourcing. She's like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. Now remember, we're looking at character qualities that can translate out of the agricultural setting of ancient Israel into the modern world. And so the character quality and principle that she exhibits here is parallel to what's called long distance resourcing, not merely driving a mile to the grocery store in an air conditioned automobile. But here's one that's the same in every culture, the very next one. She's an early riser. She rises while it is yet dark. She's not lazy slothnik. She doesn't roll over and smack the off button on her alarm when it rings. She doesn't pull the pillow over her head. She doesn't make the excuse that she's tired. She doesn't sleep in till noon. And believe me, the mother in this chapter had every right to be tired. She doesn't just think about getting up when it's dark. She does it. Everybody else is still in bed, but she gets up. She doesn't say, I'm too old, or I'm too tired, or somebody else will do it. She gets up in the dark, day after day, week after week. You get a picture of a woman that's consistent here? Month after month, year after year, decade after decade. She's responsible. She has a servant's heart. You know, there are other people who haven't gotten up yet that God has called her to serve. And that's what we find next. We find food preparation, culinary arts, if you will, before the rest of the house even gets up. She's busy preparing the necessities to make everybody else's day a success. They can count on her. She's getting up and packing bag lunches for the kids. She's getting up and packing a bag lunch for her husband going out to work somewhere. She's even getting up and packing bag lunches for the rest of the household, the servants. That means she's learned how to cook. She's learned how to cook well. She's learned how to cook in bulk. <laughs> that's something Judy could do well. We had 13 kids. <laughs> I mean, you know, we shoveled enough food in those kids to feed an army. She did every day, three times a day, cooked massive meals while those kids were growing up. And she learned how to conserve it, not waste anything of it. Remember, there's a mother with children, a husband, and as we learn in this verse, a group of servants. She's actually cooking for the servants who have some other kinds of jobs besides food preparation. And that's directly connected to the next phrase, and a portion to her maidens. She also has the responsibility of household staff management. And her day is just beginning. 
The next character trait of the mom in this family is what I would call wise consideration. At some point, she's done some calculation in price comparing on a piece of real estate. And when she has convinced that she has the best buy, she doesn't sit around and chew her fingernails, wondering if she should go through with the deal. So she considers the field and buyeth it. That means that she has available, fluid financial resources. Now, we're going to learn a few things in the next few verses that she's not merely sponging off her husband to play real estate agent. She actually has a self-generated source of income. But you know what's interesting? She's not one of these, well, I will only work in an air-conditioned office types of mothers. You know, I'm the real estate agent. I bought the field. Now I'll get somebody else to go work in it. She's willing to get her hands dirty and work. She's not busy polishing her nails and using tweezers to pull her eyebrows and then paint them back on while she primps in the mirror with her mascara. No, she's not afraid of hard work. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. It's also clear that she's involved in physical exercise to strengthen her lower and upper body. She girdeth her loins, there's her lower body, with strength and strengthens her arms, upper body. Her exercise is not a matter of just keeping her girlish figure. Remember, this is a mother. She's doing power training, strength training, because she's involved in strenuous physical activity. She has to be in shape for that. She's not making excuses about being a wilting violet while she sits around eating popcorn and vacuuming chocolates into her mouth as she stares stupidly at TV soap operas. Wisdom shows up again in the next character trait. She shows wise conservation and careful examination of her resources. It says she perceiveth that her merchandise is good. She has a careful eye for examining and putting a pass sticker on her production line. She's careful with how her resources are used, how they're prepared into finished products, how they're handled and stored. She clearly has what we like to call the Protestant work ethic. It says her candle goeth not out by night. You've heard about people who burn their candle at both ends and everybody criticizes them. Look, God commended this woman. She burned her candle at both ends. She rose early while everybody else was in bed while it was dark. Her candle goes not out by night. She's burning it on the other end too. We've bought into so many of the lazy lies of the crummy society around us that we've failed to understand what God says is godly living. Giving every ounce of our energy, every fiber, every muscle, every nerve to Christ all the time. Not part of the time. Not one day a week. Not one hour a week. From 11 to 12 on Sunday, if you go to church here, from 11 to 12, 15. Her candle goeth not out by night. We see her working late as well as rising early. She's clearly not a lazy sluggard or sloth. She's not lethargic or apathetic. She makes every minute count. She's not into taking breaks and knocking off work early. She's focused on using her time, energy, and resources for the glory of God and the good of her husband. She's clearly a woman who's trying to maximize her potential so that she can give the best possible accounting at the end of the day. And that gives us the next parallel character trait, she exercises perpetual diligence in the specific skills that she's developed. And notice, this is not natural talent. This is a developed talent that took many years of training, probably from her own mother and a lot of patient, very careful work. Look at the next skill. She has the ability to weave as well as to sew. She's making her own cloth as well as her own clothing. Ladies, if you, had, if you couldn't go down to Walmart or wherever you happen to shop, uh, I shop at the thrift stores, <laughs> but if you, if you couldn't go down and buy already made clothing, well, some of you might be able to sew a dress. I hope you can. Judy made all of our kids' clothes as they were growing up. But you know, this woman made the cloth from which she made her clothing. <laughs> a little beyond most of us, isn't it? I think so. Would you enjoy it as much if you had to make your own cloth before you could sew it? Would you be a lot more careful with the cloth and not waste any of it if you had to make every square inch of it from scratch? This mother wove the cloth that she used to sew her family's clothing. That's a developed talent. She's also compassionate and has a generous heart. Look at this. Her generosity is not merely for family members. Her generosity extends to those in need outside her family. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She could say, man, I work for this. I'm going to keep this. I'm not going to give them anything. Are you kidding me? I don't have time for those bums out there. I'm busy with my own family. But that's not the way the godly mother is described here in this passage. You know, this is really a telling and key character trait. 
Just being hard-nosed and efficient isn't enough. Because there are lots of hard-nosed, efficient, no-nonsense businesswomen in the working world today who have the same kind of business acumen that the Proverbs 31 woman had, but you rarely find them with a compassionate and generous heart involved in personally helping other people with desperate needs. They might throw a few bucks into the Salvation Army Christmas kettle, but don't ever expect them to become one of the bell ringers. Another key character trait is found in verse 21. It's introduced by the phrase, she is not afraid. If you just stop and think about those words for just a moment, those are really key words. Her life is controlled by courage, not fear. Here it's applied to one of the many circumstances of life, but that's a character trait that extends over all the circumstances of life. Even like giving to those poor people in the immediate preceding phrases. I mean, she could say, man, you know, I don't know about my retirement. I better hoard this up. I better have a savings account. You know, I know those guys need something, but let them go out and get a job. We find her courage as she looks into the future. We find her courage as she deals with the present. We find her courage as she looks back on the past and see how God has provided. Here it's applied just to one of the many circumstances of life, but that's not the only circumstance of life in which she's not afraid. An illustration is given of a circumstance that cannot be controlled, dangerous weather in this context. She's not afraid of the snow for her household. Now, you know, it's not, she's not afraid of the snow because she knows she's got a wool coat. She's not afraid of the snow for her household. She's thinking about other people who are in her care. She has no fear for them. Why? You know, a mother might not be afraid of dangerous circumstances that she can control, but there are things that are far beyond our control. You can't control the weather. This mother is not afraid of those things because of her prudent, diligent, advance preparation. She's not afraid of the snow for her household because of her next character quality. For all her household are clothed with scarlet. She's made advanced preparation so that her family is well clothed. But you know, there's a lot more in that little phrase than that. Most people say, oh yeah, her kids had red clothes. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's, not what's, that's not the only thing that's here in this passage. It's interesting that the clothing is described by its color, not by its texture or its weight. Scarlet in the Old Testament is consistently the color of redemption by blood. In the tabernacle, we find purple and scarlet and fine linen, Exodus 25, 4, where it's first found. Those are the holy colors, and the fine linen is one of the things that the godly woman has made with her hands. So we find scarlet in this text. We find fine linen in this text, and as we get down to her clothing, we're going to discover that there's purple as well. We find blue and purple and scarlet in 26.1. The veil of the tabernacle was made of blue and purple and scarlet. The book of Exodus, scarlet is found 25 times, always in relationship to items in the tabernacle and to holy worship. In Leviticus, scarlet, scarlet is found four more times in relationship to the sprinkling for purification connected to cedarwood and scarlet and hyssop. Twice more it's found in numbers in the same way. God gives symbolism in the Old Testament for a purpose. The Proverbs 31 mother is a holy mother who has placed her children symbolically under the covering of the sacrificial lambs and their blood to protect them from the dangerous things that she cannot control. And through prayer has brought them to the throne of grace for purification. That's the scarlet and the hyssop. Mothers and grandmothers, have you done that for your children? and for your grandchildren. That brings us to verse 22, which next describes her personal clothing. She's very beautifully and immaculately groomed and dressed. Tapestry here is embroidery. Hand embroidery is an ancient skill in the Middle East. When I took Judy on our honeymoon more than 40 years ago, I took her to Israel and to Greece and a cruise on the Mediterranean. I purchased for her a beautiful blouse and several other items with exquisite hand embroidery. Judy loved to embroider as well. She's taught our daughters to do it. They can do all kinds of things, crocheting, knitting, tatting, all that kind of stuff. In fact, some of them have actually won county fairs with the work that they've done. She taught them how to do that. The godly woman in Proverbs 31 is skilled in embroidery. 
delicate, fine, precise, careful work. Embroidery is labor intensive. It's time consuming. It requires great patience and skill. This is not a Chinese sweat factory knocking out 10,000 t-shirts per hour. This kind of work tells you something about the character of this woman. She's patient. She's intense. She's diligent. She's careful. She's precise and always appropriate so that she will look her best for her husband and for his reputation. She's doing this work on very expensive cloth. You know, she's doing it with silk and purple. She then makes her own clothing from that silk and purple. You know, when you're dealing with that kind of stuff, you don't want to make any careless cuts. When you're working with hand embroidered fabric, silk and purple are seen in scripture in connection with royalty and with high status. This is not just a lower class woman who must do all these other temporal things like digging in the dirt as a mother. It's not just so that she can survive. She's a woman who has delicate beauty and culture in her soul. And even though she's personally hand making all of her clothing, remember that that was the woman who is a queen teaching a king in verse one of this chapter. King Lemuel, who is Solomon, the words that the prophecy that his mother taught him. What my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows. The woman who's doing this stuff is a queen teaching a king. That's also the same woman that does the dirty work of field buying and vineyard planning in verse 16. In spite of her culture and gifts, she's humble. She doesn't expect anybody else to do her work. She's appropriate, gracious, well-groomed, prepared for every occasion, whether with working men and women or with high society. She is truly flexible, humble, and non-assuming woman. Her clothing tells you a lot about her inner being. I'd like to spend some time on that, but I won't. You know, it's not that clothes make the man, but clothes do tell you a lot about the person. For example, Proverbs also talks about the attire of an harlot. Clothes will tell other people something about you. The attire of a harlot, you can tell who's the prostitute out there on the streets of Las Vegas. No Christian woman should ever wear that kind of seductive, morally defective clothing. Now here's an important one. She's a husband builder. She's a husband builder. Her character is one of the principal causes of her husband's honor, verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. He's not just in the gates or going through the gates. He sits among the elders of the land. That's a position of authority and prestige. And remember, this chapter is about the woman, the mother. He's not the one who gave her the status, although that will come with that position. But because of this woman, he is in that position. Because of this godly mother, his status is enhanced. Wives, it's your job to be husband builders, not women who bring shame to your husbands. The virtuous woman, remember that's the first quality character in this passage. The virtuous woman gives a crown to her husband. Listen to Proverbs 12.4. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. The virtuous woman. We've been talking about the virtuous woman. A virtuous woman who can find for her price is far above rubies. Proverbs 12 tells us a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. She enhances his status. But she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. When you think of a woman who brings shame to her husband, think these two words. Bone cancer. Bone cancer. She that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. But when you think of the godly woman, the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31, think royalty. She is a crown on his head. Quite a contrast between a crown and bone cancer, isn't it? 
Verse 24 tells us that she's commercially diligent with her own products. She personally produces more than enough for her family, so she's able to sell her handiwork to others to add to the family income. Verse 24, she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchants. That is the sashes that they tie around their middle. Fancy things. You know, like a real fancy tie. I don't have one, but let's imagine a real fancy tie. She was making, hand-making these fancy sashes, selling them to a merchant who was then selling to other people who said, man, that's good stuff. I think I'll want one of those. But you know, her focus is not on temporal things. Know what it says about her real clothing in the next verse. Her clothing is not only external, but it's internal. It says, strength and honor are her clothing. You know, there's a power and respect for the type of mother described in this passage. She's fully respected. Nobody makes jokes about the donkey that this man has for his wife. Nobody will ever say that she's a loose cannon rolling around the deck blowing holes in the ship. When she walks into a room, the men stand up to honor her and bow in respect. She graciously acknowledges their courtesy with a smile and a gentle nod of the head. That's the kind of woman we're talking about. That's the godly mother that is described in this passage here. Her attitude and her outlook on life, or if summarized in one word, would be she shall rejoice in time to come. Her future outlook is joyful. It's not grim. It's not bitter. It's not sullen. It's not despondent. It's not self-centered. It's not complaining. Women who are filled with joy, and you know this, women who are filled with joy are a delight to be around. They don't even have to say anything. Joy radiates from their faces. Joy twinkles from their eyes. Joy informs their graceful movements. They don't stop around like clodhoppers with grim and determined looks of death and destruction for anybody that crosses their path. Joy brings a sense of ordered calmness and peace. Now, we're not talking about excited giddiness. We're talking about joy, the inner sense of well-being, that things are right with God, that things are in perfect harmony with Him that we're in fellowship and communion with him, and as a result, in fellowship and communion with those who are around us. A woman who is filled with joy is an attractive woman, no matter how physically homely she is. Joy is one of the ninefold fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Joy not only attracts others to you, it attracts others to Christ. And here's a foundational quality in verse 26. Wise speech. That means that she has a wise heart because that's what Jesus said. What's in your heart comes out of your mouth. Matthew 12, 35. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Again, in Luke, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It doesn't stop there, you see. She has a kind tongue, too. She not only is looking with joy into the future, but it also says she has a kind tongue. She's not a fishwife. She's not nagging. She's not critical. She's not a gossip. She's not sarcastic. She's not acerbic. She's not stupid or foolish or inane or trivial or airheaded. It says in her tongue is the law of kindness. You know, law is the rule of precision, discipline, accuracy, accountability, truth, and consistency for the benefit of all. In other words, her tongue is perfectly disciplined, perfectly ruled, perfectly governed by the strictest code of action. Do you understand that that is a very big statement in light of the rest of Scripture? That is a huge statement. James chapter 1, verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Chapter 3, he spends 18 verses talking about the tongue. And now, if you can't control your tongue, if your tongue is like that loose cannon we talked about earlier, rolling around the deck of the ship and blowing holes in the ship, your religion is vain. It says about this woman, in her tongue is the law of kindness. It's a law that controls what she says. Kindness is the law for this woman. I wish I could read to you all that passage in James. Our time is already up, so I'm going to close with just a couple of things here. 
Ladies, you want to be godly mothers and wives? Start with your tongue. If you can't control your tongue, James says your religion is vain no matter how pious you try to be otherwise. She looks well to the ways of her household, verse 27, and eateth not the bread of idleness. She looks well. She's perceptive. She's focused on the task that God has given her. She's not distracted by all the more exciting and fun things that she could be doing. She's attentive and responsible. She's not an idle time waster. She understands that you can never waste time. You can only waste your life. Remember that, folks. You don't waste time. It's going to go by anyway. You're wasting your life when you're not making it productive for Christ. It says, she looketh well to the ways of her household. Well implies diligent, unobstructed study and observation. She wants to know precisely what's going on. And it's a fascinating word for ways in this verse. It's not the common word for a road, which is a stationary object, a derrick. The word that's used here is halika, a walking, a walking. That's the word that's used for a procession, for a march, for a caravan. A caravan of a group of people. She looketh well to the ways of her household. Her household is a group of people that she has to keep together. They're marching like a caravan in the same direction over a desert. If anybody wanders away, they'll die of starvation and thirst. She is the one who will make sure that they are all accounted for, that they all stay in line. She's the one who makes sure that they are all in the door at the end of the journey. I once heard a story of a man on his deathbed. He had many children. Some lived very far away. He kept hanging on, waiting for the last one to arrive. Finally, he feebly looked up at his dear wife with tears in his eyes and asked, Are the children all inside? Yes, she replied. Then close the door, he said as he closed his eyes to take his last breath. This mother here in Proverbs 31 is the mother who makes sure that all the children are inside. She wants to make sure that all of her children are saved, that they're safe across the desert. They're in the safety and protection of the caravan, safely to their destination. We're five minutes over. I'm going to stop there. I wish I could finish Proverbs 31. There's so much more. <laughs> I'm halfway through page 10, but there's no way we can get the rest. Some other time, the Lord willing, some other place perhaps. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and how we thank you for godly mothers. Like this mother described for us in such precise detail, such beautiful detail, such powerful detail, such exquisite detail. As the woman whom you call a virtuous woman, a woman who excels with excellence in righteousness, a woman who is totally committed to the calling you've placed on her life, a woman who loves and honors and submits to her husband, who's a husband builder, a woman of grace and yet of diligence and hard work, a woman who knows not only how to control her time and energies and produce things, but who has the law of kindness in her tongue. A truly gracious woman. Father, we thank you for the mothers, the grandmothers. Even some of us can remember our great-grandmothers and the godly example that they set for us. Those of us who are men can remember our mothers and our wives if we've been married and how you worked in them to knock off rough edges in our lives. That you used them to help us be more perfectly conformed to the image of Christ. Father, we thank you for giving us mothers. And we beg you on behalf of the mothers in this country, especially those who are Christian mothers, but as they are raising the next generation of warriors to fight the good fight of faith, that you'll give them wisdom and strength and courage and resources and diligence. That you'll give them husbands who love them and provide for them 
and protect them and protect their children. Father, we're involved in a war, a long war against God, and we're the soldiers you've called to battle. How we thank you for headquarters where there's been training taking place with godly mothers quietly, graciously, unassumingly teaching and training the children that they might step into the shoes of the warriors that fall in battle. Bless them, Father, this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.